Thanks, Jonas. Um, as you said, I'm talking about passwords again. I'm actually not going to be introducing any new research. It's still an ongoing topic. I'm going to be talking about the things that we already know for several years, and yet nobody seems to be doing them, or almost nobody. Uh, as Jonas said, my name is Avi Duglin. I come from Israel. Uh, the important things, in case you ever want to buy me a drink, I like my whiskey smoky. I like my beer stout. I like my coffee strong. Not necessarily in that order. Okay. Um, as Jonas said, uh, I do lead the uh, OSP, uh, Israel chapter. We have a great conference, uh, usually around September. This year we had 650 people. Uh, free conference if anybody ever wants to show up there. It's a really great conference also. I, I hope uh, within a couple of years this one also will also be that size. Uh, looking forward to it. Looks good. Um, I also lead, uh, I'm also a moderator on Security Stack Exchange. Anybody here familiar with the site? Who has a profile there? Oh, fantastic. This is great. Anybody not familiar with it? It's the security version of Stack Overflow basically. Always very good to, uh, to use. I'm a moderator there. You all probably see my uh, Tigger face around. Uh, also on uh, Twitter, that's where, the way you find me. Uh, my free time, I also spend one day a week uh, volunteering at a high school, uh, teaching uh, cyber defense to a bunch of high school kids. Never too early to start, so that's always good. And I also do a lot of research and things like that. But um, as I said, I'm going to be talking about passwords. All right. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, uh, breaches, a lot of different things in the news lately about uh, passwords. For example, very recently, um, we discovered about a huge uh, LinkedIn breach where they discovered we cracked most of the passwords. Uh, here's another uh, random one, 91 million user accounts with plain text passwords. How is it in 2016 people are still keeping plain text passwords, right? Uh, adult friend finder. I won't ask you who has a profile there, but uh, Another, good, another uh, interesting hack there, again, this is, you know, people might say, okay, I don't care about you know, my internet radio, what my password is there, but I think people really care about having a good, strong password on Adult Friend Finder, and yet, after they, just, they cracked 412 million accounts, turns out the uh, password uh, patterns there are pretty similar to pretty much any other site that we see. And I could just keep going on and on and on. When I started uh, giving this uh, talk a few years ago, I uh, started ranting about passwords, I would give a, a few examples from the recent years. Nowadays, I could go back two weeks and, and I'd come out with dozens of accounts, I, of, of breaches. It's no longer interesting to talk about which account was hacked. It's just a, a small sampling of huge sites. We have 350 million MySpace accounts, 235. I don't even know what most of these sites are. I, I don't really care at this point. There's just more passwords out there, more confirmation of how bad our password hygiene is. When I say our password hygiene, I'm talking about both users and developers. Okay. Now, the, the thing is this. Okay, we're going to go see, you know, let me give an example of some of the, the passwords. This is uh, already two or three, three years old already. Uh, the Adobe uh, hack was 130 million passwords. Of course, Adobe kept the passwords stored in pretty much almost the worst way possible short of plain text. But more interesting is when, when we get a, a new breach, a new set of uh, hacked passwords, of course, the researchers always jump on that. What kind of statistics, statistics uh, uh, what kind of passwords are people using? And no big surprise here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is the most popular password. Much stronger than that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and password. So you get a lot of interesting things. Uh, interestingly, um, most of these set of passwords don't usually change. Sometimes they move around. Uh, monkey is a lot less popular now than it used to be. Okay? Uh, let me in, somebody's just really fed up with the site, just let me in already. You know? So you get the same uh, uh, things. Now, more recently, we had one. I don't even remember which site it was from. I think it was a, a correlate from a few different sites. Um, again, this is uh, from end of 2015. More statistics. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, got cut off at the top. One two three five six is still the most popular password by far. We're talking two three percent of the people are using one two three five six. Interestingly, um, brand new password. People got wise to it. Passwords need to be stronger. So we're adding a zero at the end. One two three five six nine zero. That's strong passwords. And of course, monkey keeps moving down the list, which is very sad to me. Interestingly, 2015, a new set of passwords. And of course, Han Solo. So this is new. So it's very interesting to see the change. And by the way, this is not password. That's a zero there. And so the O, if anybody's wondering why that's twice. Good, strong password. Now, here's the thing. It's not the user's fault. I don't blame the users for choosing bad passwords. I don't even blame the developers for building systems and not uh, uh, storing it correctly. It's not their fault. It's your fault. Everybody here is smart, is technical. You all know a lot better than that. And yet we as an industry keep feeding the users bad advice. 
Okay? In uh, Jewish religious law, we have a concept of a rule that the community cannot abide. And yet that is what we consistently keep doing with passwords. We're giving the users conflicting information, information of advice that is both wrong and impossible for them to use, but this is what everybody keeps telling them. And we as an industry have been doing this for years. Part of the reason I'm, I'm ranting about this, part of the reason that this really irks me, is because up until a few years ago, I gave this bad advice too. I drank the same Kool-Aid. I thought, well, you know, that's what we, the advice is. That's what the regulations are. That's what we need to be doing. Until we actually stopped and took a moment to actually look and understand what the threats are against passwords. What risks do we actually need to deal with? What do we need to actually mitigate and protect against when we're dealing with passwords? So, uh, get cut off here. So, Per Thorsheim, um, anybody here familiar with the, with the term? One of the, he's the founder of uh, PasswordsCon. He was here a couple years ago. Um, one of my uh, uh, heroes. He does a lot of real good numeric research on passwords. So he actually asked a lot of people, he did a, a, um, a survey of, does your password meet the requirements of what a good password is? And as you can tell, almost everybody, the blue, the red, and the green, almost everybody said, yes, for the most part, my passwords are good and strong. And then he mentioned something else. He knew for a fact that most of them didn't even know what it means to have a good password. He didn't know, they didn't know what the password policy is. How could they be saying that they have a good password if they don't know what it is? Okay, a lot of interesting statistics. 64% of users write down their password. 75% uh, use the same password for different applications. Corporate users tend to use season and year as a password. Just last night, we were at, uh, a few of us were at a restaurant nearby and a big sign of, uh, um, Elgotech, I think, was the name of the restaurant, 2015, hashtag at the end. That's a good, strong password for the Wi-Fi. And we were like, on the one hand, we were kind of mocking the restaurant for having such a ridiculously easy password. But as I said, it's not their fault. They don't, it's not their job to know what good passwords are. And we haven't been giving them good advice about it. Per Thorshaw uh, continued to do some more research and just asked random non-technical people, how many passwords do you have? Now, interestingly enough, he got a lot of conflicting answers based on the fact that users don't need to care what a password is. Some people don't count pins or passphrases. That's something completely different. Some people have a, a confusion between what is a password, what is an account. They don't necessarily count that. Sometimes they only think about the passwords that they've been using in the past week or two. And not, oh yeah, oh by the way, I have to uh, log in once a year to a government site to file my taxes. I don't count that password because I don't think about it. Okay? So it's not the user's job to worry about this. Uh, Taylor Swift, Swift on Security on Twitter account, anybody familiar with that? She goes on a lot about we need to give the plain users, the regular non-technical users, the tools how to deal with the security that is already there. All right? I'm not talking about anybody in this room. All can probably manage to deal with passwords in a relatively paranoid manner. I'm, talking about, I'm not even talking about my mother who's completely paranoid. I'm talking about my father. My father is a technical troglodyte. Okay, he's what we call a 12 o'clock flasher. You know, all the devices in the house are still flashing 12 o'clock because he can't figure out how to change the time. <laughs> okay, so he doesn't, know, he doesn't need to know about this. He runs a business. He doesn't care about what pa makes a good, strong password. He doesn't need to give thought to that. He just says what people tell him. He's got a security guy telling him and feeding him bad advice. And we as an industry have been doing that. And we're still doing that. We still see a lot of these things. So as I said, the real way to decide what is a good password, what we need to be doing, is to go back and think, okay, wait a second. What is a password supposed to be doing? Right? What are the threats it's mitigating against? What are the attacks on passwords? So I categorize this into three uh, sets, three different types of attacks. So first of all, we have the indirect technical attacks, attacks that are really on pretty much any data, right? Um, not using TLS. Okay, fine. That's a you could steal passwords if somebody sends it over HTTP, but you know that's true of really anything. Okay, if you have malware installed on your computer, sure they could steal your passwords, they could do anything else, but that's not really an attack directly on password. Sure, we need to be secure in machines with everything like, else like that, but that's nothing to do with the password itself. So I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to ignore that category for a moment. And then we have the technical attacks that are referring specifically to passwords. Right? What are the main attacks? On the one hand, might be trying to brute force. Uh, trying to guess what the user's password is, trying to log in using scripts, right? Everybody familiar with that? Trying to break in, um, you know, OWASP Zap has a tool that can do this automatically also, to try and guess the password on the website. Or, what we're hearing very often, as I started off with, somebody steals the database of all the user's passwords 
and trying to crack and, and either retrieve the password or guess what the password is or crack the, um, the hashing, whatever it is, and be able to steal all these millions and millions of passwords all at once. So that's another uh, type of attack that we need to deal with. The other thing is what I call sociological weaknesses, the human part, the human element. Okay? So on the one hand, we have phishing, right? convincing the user to provide his password in the wrong place. Everybody's familiar with that. Then we have a very advanced attack called, I call the chocolate attack. Everybody familiar with that? It's um, also known as asking. Okay? They did a, a few studies, uh, um, I think it was in London and Paris, uh, asking users, if I give you a chocolate bar, will you tell me your corporate password? I don't know the exact number, it was like 70 something percent gave them the actual password for chocolate. Okay? I'm sure everybody here heard of Edward Snowden. We've released a whole lot of documents from the NSA. The point was he had access to documents which he wasn't allowed to get to. How did he get them? He used his, his co-workers' passwords. How did he get their passwords? He asked for it. Okay. Just recently, there was another uh, big thing in the news. Uh, some kid uh, um, hacked into a whole bunch of celebrity sites, like uh, major singers, and leaked uh, um, songs and, and music albums and things like that. Again, how did he get them? By simply asking for the password. These are very advanced uh, attacks, like asking for passwords. And then we have other types of weaknesses. Sticky notes. Everybody has, you know, can't remember the password, they write it down, stick it on the laptop. It's very easy. And then we have the bigger, more uh, problematic problem of password reuse. I mentioned this a few times. People use the same password over and over on a lot of different sites. So sure, you have a really strong password for your bank, but you also use the same password for Dropbox and for Google and for my sister's cat's blog. You also use the same password, it's no longer secret. So these are the types of attacks we actually need to deal with when we're worried about how do we define what a password is, when, we, when we're discussing password hygiene, when we talk about how to make a strong password, how to protect a password, or what to do with password. When we're giving any kind of advice about passwords, these are the things that we need to take into consideration, both how to make a strong password and how to make it so that uh, we don't have to worry about all these sociological weaknesses, the human part. Okay? So these are the two aspects that we actually need to take into account. So I'm going to talk about those two aspects, both how do we define, how do we select good passwords, and how do we protect them. Okay? But before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about brute force. I want to share one word with you about brute force, and that word is entropy. Does anybody know why I'm going to talk about entropy in the context of brute force? A few people. Well, what is entropy? Well, I'm sure everybody has heard the word in maybe a physics class or something like that. But let's go to Wikipedia and find the exact definition of entropy. Entropy is the average amount of information contained in each message received. Not quite as helpful as you might expect from Wikipedia. But let's keep going. A different article, Wikipedia says, it makes sense to define information as the negative of the logarithm of the probability distribution. Now that's helpful. Now we know what, what entropy really is. Come on, Wikipedia, do better than that. I hope it's all clear now. It's all good? So let's actually go to a surprising source of explanation. Uh, it's not often we expect to find a good explanation from NIST, but here's actually what we find, the real definition, because NIST has been doing a lot of work around password security. So NIST defines entropy as an estimate of the average amount of work required to guess the password of a selected user. Now that's really important, because when we're talking about we want to protect uh, against brute forcing a password, the question is, how much work does it take to brute force that password? Do I need to do 1,000 guesses? Do I need to do 5 million guesses? That's where entropy comes in. If I know everything there is to know about the password except for the password itself, how long will it take me to guess your password? How much work will it take me to do? So let's take a look at where this uh, comes into account. So entropy is really the opposite. It's the countermeasure against brute force. The more entropy I have, the more work I need to do to be able to brute force your password. Now, this makes perfect sense when we're understanding what, what entropy is. It's how many guesses you need to make to be able to guess it. Now, entropy we measure usually in bits, bits of entropy, how strong it is. Anybody familiar with uh, key length? Uh, encryption key is measured in bits. That's the entropy, typically. Anybody know what uh, a bit of entropy looks like? If you close your eyes and try to imagine. Picture a bit of entropy. Anybody know what that looks like? This right here, this is one bit of entropy. You flip a coin, that's one bit of entropy. Now, if you were to try and guess without looking what, what I flipped, if it's heads or tails, 
50% of the time, you're going to get it right, statistically speaking. What if I flipped it twice? Well, then you need to make two guesses to get 50% statistically. And if I guess, flipped it three times, I get head, head, tails. What are the odds of you guessing that correctly? Well, you're going to be able to get 50% statistical uh, correctness. You're going to need to make four guesses. So each additional time I flip the coin, it doubles the amount of work you need to do to be able to guess what I flipped. Okay? And this is the perfect source of randomness. You just flip a coin, and that's one bit of randomness. Flip it 128 times, you got a fantastic encryption key there. Of course, you'll probably be raw from flipping the coin so many times. Another way of getting a good source of randomness outside of a computer is this. Anybody that can't see it, it's a, one of the smallest dice possible. Uh, you roll a dice that's um, you know, one to six, that's a good source of randomness also. So if we have an encryption key that's 128 bit long, okay, on average, I'm gonna need to make, if I wanna try and brute force this encryption key, I need to make uh, two to the power of 128 minus one guesses, two to the power of 127 guesses to be able to guess what this encryption key is. And that's why when we talk about uh, strong encryption, things like that, they say 128-bit key is pretty strong, it's strong enough because there's no way I could actually make those many guesses before, you know, without actually destroying the sun to get that much energy. So entropy is a good measure of password strength. Okay? The more entropy you have, the more resilient your password is against brute force attacks, which is really the main point of making a strong password. Right? Now, this takes a few um, assumptions into account. It needs to be actually random. Um, if I have a die here that's one to six, sure, then each value is equal. But if I have three sides are one, and then I have two and four, then 50% chance that I'm gonna get a one. So that's not exactly equiprobable. That's not equal probability here for each value. So that's not fair. Now, the other thing we need to take into account is that when we're measuring entropy, we're not measuring the result. Okay, if I tell you head, head, tails, does that mean I flip the coin three times? Or that's just what I'm thinking of right now? Or maybe it's because of what I said before. So there's no real way of knowing. If I tell you the result, if I tell you a password, there's no way of knowing what the entropy actually is. The only way of knowing is if I know how you created it. If you flipped a coin three times, then I'll know that it was actually random. If you just wrote it down, then that's not really random. So when we're talking about entropy measuring password strength, that we're talking about the process. So let's start, look at a few examples. For example, if I have a password of six completely random letters, okay, uppercase only, let's just assume English, just make it uh, uh, clear. Okay, so we're talking about 26 possibilities. For each character, there are 26 possibilities, 26 letters. Okay? That gives us approximately 4.7 bits of entropy. Why is that? Because two to the power of 4.7 is about 26. So the way math works. Okay, you look at how many bits it takes to represent 26. How many bits? You need, uh, well, it uses five bits, but doesn't use all of them. It uses a bit less than, four, than five bits. Okay. Just to show you what I'm talking about, if I take a, a calc exa, right, and flip it over to programmer, okay, I can write here 26, and it shows me very nicely the bits that it uses. Right? So it's more than four bits, but not quite five bits. So this is how we measure entropy for a given uh, character set. Okay? So each character gives us approximately 4.7 bits of entropy. And this is where it's nice that we're talking about bits and log uh, of two, is that for each additional bit, we can just uh, double it. Or if we're talking about multiplication, then it's very easy to add. So for each character, there's two to the power of 4.7 possibilities six characters, then we're talking about to the power of six. Very easy to do the math here, 4.7 times six is about 28.2. So we have two to the power of 28.2 possible passwords in this password space. Now that's not a bad number, right? 308 million possibilities? Not gonna be able to guess that in my mind right now. Not gonna be able to walk through that. But if I'm trying to brute force it, how many guesses do I need to do until statistically, odds are, 50% at least, that I'll be able to guess your password? I need to go about half that, right? 28.2 minus one, okay? So about half that many guesses. So if I make this many guesses, statistically, I'll have guessed your password. Statistically, 50%, good enough for me. Now, if I'm talking about um, a more complex password, okay, we're talking about, it could be uppercase, lowercase, numbers, symbols, punctuation, what they like to call special characters. 
Sorry, there's no, nothing special about an exclamation point. Um, so now the numbers look a little bit different. Now I have 94 possibilities for each character, right? 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, 10 numbers, and most keyboards have about 32 different uh, typable symbols. Some languages have more, some less. We can play with it. It's about 94 possibilities for each character. 94 possibilities requires 6.5 bits of entropy. Why is that? Because it's more than six, but not quite get up to the next one. Right? So it's a little bit less than uh, 6.5. So for each character, now we have 6.5 bits of entropy. If I'm talking about a six character password, where each character could be any one of those 94 possibilities, then we're talking about to the power of 39 possible passwords. We're talking about 549 billion possibilities. All right? Just by changing the character set, I really up the amount of possibilities. If I'm trying to, do, to, if I'm trying to brute force this password, that's going to take me a heck of a lot of guesses to be able to guess. On average, I might get lucky getting the first three. Unlikely. Now, if I'm talking about an eight-character password, again, all the possible uh, possibilities, then we're talking about to the power of 52. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that number. And, well, it's a heck of a lot of work um, to be able to try and guess that statistically. <clears throat> so this, is, this looks like a good, strong password, right? That's a pretty strong. To be able to try and brute force that, to do that many guesses, that's ridiculous. Okay, but the problem is this. We already saw users don't make completely random complex passwords. Right? They're going to be a lot easier because they need to remember those passwords. There's no way I'm going to remember an eight character completely random password with all kinds of symbols and everything like that without any kind of mnemonic device or any kind of shortening or really just take the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because that's what I need. That's the simplest thing that actually matches. So if I'm talking about protecting against brute force, it's not just the possible passwords. It needs to be completely random. But actually, it's usually a lot less than that. Here's a statistic. I think this is um, about a year and a half old. 40% of pa all passwords appear on the top 100. So if I take the 100 passwords, Again, statistically speaking, uh, I take that, I'm going to get 40% of the users, just out of 100 guesses per user. Okay? That's not a lot of work. That's not a lot of entropy. Let's up it a bit to 500 passwords, the top 500 list. 71% of the users of the passwords will be on that list. So if I want to brute force your password, statistically speaking, I don't even need to do 500. 500 passwords, 500 guesses, statistically speaking, will already give me 70%. Again, if there's no restrictions or constraints on the website. Okay. So if I'm talking about the most common passwords, if I want to guess from the, let's say, the top 100 passwords from the Adobe hack, then really the total entropy in that list is a total of 6.65 bits of entropy. You all familiar, understand why the math is working here? The bits of entropy to the power of 6.65 is about 100. Okay. So that's not a lot of entropy. That's not a lot of work. Okay, so if I assume that your password is in the top 100, well, statistically speaking, it's enough for me to try the top 50. And statistically speaking, 50% of those people on the list, I'll get you. Okay? But let's expand it a bit. Let's take a lowercase word okay? and add a digit. Okay? So it's fair to assume most people know about 65,000 words. Again, we're talking about English speakers knowing English words because that's the easiest thing to correlate. So 65,000 words gives us approximately just under 20 bits of entropy. 2 to the power of 20 is just a bit more than 65,000. Okay? So 2 to the power of 16 plus uh, 3.4 bits of entropy for the digits. Each digit is about 3.4 bits of entropy per digit. So if I'm counting how many words plus uh, one digit, that's giving me 19.4 bits of entropy, which means all the guesses I need to do is right here, 327,000 uh, approximately guesses. And statistically speaking, I guessed your password. Now, this is really important because we're talking about protecting our passwords against brute force. All the recommendations, anytime anybody gives you an idea or a pa uh, recommendation or password policy, it's to protect against brute force. That's the whole point. So now let's get back to it. Let's talk about password policies. Okay? Now, when we're talking about selecting po uh, passwords, there's really uh, two different aspects here, or two or even three. Number one, I want to use good passwords. Okay? I go to my bank, I want my bank to have a good password for me, good strong password. 
don't want anybody to be able to break in, regardless of what anybody else's password is on the site. Number two, if I'm building a system or if I'm running an organization, I want to make sure that everybody, all my users, have good, strong passwords. Right? And number three, I want users to actually, I want to improve the state of the industry. I want most users to have, to understand what a good, strong password is and how to do this efficiently. I want my father to be able to do this without asking me every time. Wouldn't that be nice? So let's talk about a typical password policy. What does a typical uh, corporate password policy usually include? Anybody? Sorry? Eight. eight digits, a minimal amount of digits, right? Six, eight, 12, whatever it is, a minimal amount of digits. Sometimes we even have a maximum. It's very popular in banks, I'm not sure why. Okay, what else? What else do we usually put in there? At least two of the following character sets. Character sets, right? Complexity, they call that, right? Makes sense, we saw why. At least two or at least three of these, so it's not all numbers or all uppercase, have a combination in there. What else, anybody familiar with it? Other popular things? Sorry? I'm sorry? Not present in any dictionary, that's right. I have that over here. It should not match the username. It shouldn't be a common password. And we need to expire it. We need to change these passwords every 30 days, every 90 days. Some regulations even require this. And shouldn't, if you change the password, it should be one of your last uh, 16 passwords that you used in the previous uh, uh, changes. Okay? This is a typical password policy, right? Uh, sometimes it looks something like that. All right, this is what typical password policies is. Um, you know, if your password policy doesn't upset your users, you're not doing it right. Okay. Yeah. Now the problem with this is, the problem with this is there's something very, uh, uh, very basic missing from all these password policies. Here's some more examples. I don't even remember where all these sites are from. Um, let's go back a second. Um, you have to have at least one digit, one lowercase, one uppercase. Very typical between six and ten. Uh, I think this is actually from British Airways, this one. And it gives you nice tips how to use uh, a good, strong password. We're going to come back to those tips in a moment. Okay? Here's a few more examples. Some t uh, PCI compliance requires at least seven, uh, uppercase, lowercase. Um, must have special characters. Can't contain the user ID. Must be different. Very typical. Very typical corporate. Uh, and anything that requires any kind of regulation. Um, here's gets even more complex, people like to be very creative. You know, they miss their calling as a writer, so they get to uh, uh, create this whole big script of what must contain, can't contain any of these characters, but has to contain those characters. So it gets really interesting, and sometimes it gets even ridiculous. You know, have to, it, it must be exactly eight characters, but also between 10 and 128 characters. So finding a password that will meet that policy, that's gonna be kind of tricky. It's gonna require some kind of magic in there be both eight characters and between 10 and 128. Now, very interesting, anybody that gets amused by these, there's a great account on Twitter called Your Password is Too Strong. And that's where I got this one from. And there's some really great examples there, just ridiculous things of like, and, and that's part of the problem with our password policies. They wind up being weakening of your password rather than making them stronger, okay? So what is actually is missing from all these password policies? Paying attention to strength. What actually makes the password strong? Anybody? Entropy. Right? Entropy is the measure of the strength of your password. And none of these password policies actually even refer to the concept of entropy. So which is actually the most important? Complexity of the password? You know, the, how many characters you use, or how many possibilities per character, or the length of the password? Who thinks it's the complexity that's, mo that's the most important? Who thinks it's the length that's most important? Yeah, you're all wrong. <laughs> what did I just tell you? It's the entropy. The entropy is what matters. You could have a ridiculously long password that has very little entropy, right? A and B. You could have a very complex password that's short and still not having a lot of entropy either, right? You could take the entire set of Unicode characters. Give me one. That's pretty complex, right? Come on, one Unicode character. You have, what, 65 or 2 million uh, possibilities. That's not very, a lot of entropy, though. Not to mention the usability there. Oh, I could have 10 digits. That's a nice long password, 10 digits. But that's still only about 33 bits of entropy if it's completely random. And if it's not random, it's even worse. Right? The only way to talk about strength of password is entropy. There, it makes no sense to talk about the strength of the password, password policies, how to protect it, how to make this, if you don't mention entropy. Entropy is the only thing that matters. Sure, 
if you have a long password, you have a lot of room to make it very, uh, to have a lot of entropy. It's what we call gentle entropy. So it makes it very easy to slowly add in more entropy, make it longer and you have more room. Complexity gives you the ability to squeeze more entropy into each character. So both of these are options to give us more entropy or how to, how to represent the entropy, how to hold the entropy. But the only way to get, to get the entropy is from randomness. Okay? Randomness is the entropy. Okay? So sure, you have a longer password, it's easier to hold more entropy. Now, very often we see a lot of sites try to measure the entropy of your password. Well, you can't ever really be sure, can you? I mean, nine, 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 that might be random, for all you know. It's, but you don't really, but you can't know. That's the problem. All right. Now, we see a lot of password uh, meters, password, uh, um, password strength meters, try and show you. I don't think anybody will think that that's a strong password, right? That's basically uh, top the, uh, keys on my keyboard, one, two, three, four, Q, W, E, R, and then shift again, shift one, two, three, four. That's basically, and this presents it as 100% strength, the strongest password you could ever have. Nobody thinks that's, that's random. Now, and you can see a lot of these different types of password meters. Uh, this is one of the better password meters. It breaks it down to each of the categories and gives different weights for everything. And yet, again, it's still measuring 1, 2, 3, 4, Q, W, E, R, shift 1, 2, 3, 4, again, as 100% very strong. Because again, this is trying to, to figure out we're weighting each category differently. We're tr trying to weight the password, but it's not actually paying attention to entropy. There's no real strength here. Okay? One of the better uh, password meters, and by the way, I mentioned Per Thorshein before. He does all the research on passwords. He's a very uh, big uh, proponent uh, of password meters. It's great. And he says, it, and he's got a good point, because it gamifies the password generation. The users want to hit 100%. So one of the password meters has a dancing bunny. The stronger your password is, the more the, the bunny dances. So of course, everybody's going to try and make a bigger, stronger password to get the bunny to dance. Everybody wants to see a dancing bunny, right? Except that the problem is it's not really a strong password. So I agree with him on the one hand that gam gamification is a great idea. And password meter is great for gamification, except that it doesn't actually deal with what strong passwords are. Strong, pa strong passwords could never come from human heads. Humans are not random. They did a study of, uh, um, Keep asking, keep doing the study over and over again. Ask a room full of people to choose a random number between one and ten. Around seventy percent chose seven. Another twenty-five percent chose three. Because you know these are prime numbers, I guess. I don't know. Prime is more. Ra nobody knows. And yet everybody chooses seven as the random number. Again, I said seventy percent. I probably made that up because you know it's, it's seven. So it's a random number. So the problem is that pe humans should not be trying to beat the password meter. They shouldn't be thinking about what the password is. It needs to be random. I shouldn't be thinking about how to beat it. So yeah, so if I'm stuck, and I'm, I'm stuck in the legacy system, and I need my humans to generate good passwords, then password meters are great for that. It's great gamification. Give them the dancing bunny, and give them what they, what they want to see if they need to generate it. But better yet is to not have the humans choose their own passwords in the first place. And we're going to talk about recommendations, good recommendations, in a moment. Now, if you really need to give a password meter, the only good one that I've actually seen or heard of is called uh, ZXCVBN. I don't even know how to pronounce that. It's basically the bottom uh, five characters, right? Bottom six characters on the keyboard, ZXCVBN. And this is a very good project. It's uh, uh, built by Dropbox originally. They open sourced it. It's a very small, lightweight JavaScript library that actually ch does check for a lot of different things. Okay? It checks for the common passwords. It checks for character sets. But it checks for a lot of other things. It checks for common password topologies. Okay? For example, the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, Q, W, E, R that I showed before, it shows that the score is 1 out of 4. It recognizes that humans usually choose keys very close on the keyboard. And there's very common patterns, very common topologies of where I choose the password from. If, how, if I'm going to create a password, that's how I'm going to do it. And ZXCVBN is familiar with a lot of those things. And then it tries to correlate, if I were to try and brute force this, how long would it take according to different techniques, whether it's a dictionary attack, running through all the possible, uh, um, possible passwords. And it breaks it down to a lot of different things. And then one of the things that it actually returns is it, turns, it returns a JSON object 
One of the things that it returns is the entropy. Okay, that's the main thing of ZXCVBN. It actually talks about entropy. Now, it doesn't know how you really generated the password. It's an estimate of your entropy. Okay? According to the password, it looks like you didn't hit any of these topologies, and therefore it is, uh, you have this many bits of randomness. Apparently. It's a guess. Okay? So if you have to use a password meter, this is a good one. Better yet, other solutions. So again, I, as I said, entropy is a problem, is a question of the process. It's an attribute of the process, not of the actual end, end result, right? So you can't really uh, measure, the result, uh, measure the process based on the result, okay? It's not cooking here. You can't say, I baked the cake well because the cake tastes good. It doesn't matter. It really does matter because you can't measure what really is. So we need to talk about how to generate the process to generate good, strong passwords. Now, when we talk about all these classic password policies, it doesn't even relate at, at all to the process of how you choose the password. It doesn't relate to what the strength of the password is with uh, entropy and so on. But there's still something else. There's still something else missing from this whole conversation about entropy. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I just wanted to uh, go back a few years. Anybody familiar with XKCD, this XKCD? It's already like four or five years old. It's mainstream. People should know this. And yet people still miss out on it. So it's a very good kind of breaking down a typical password policy solution, how to comply with the password policy. These are the recommendations that we get from the security department. Okay? And it breaks it down to see the actual strength of this. Let's just walk through this. Each square here is one bit of entropy, right? that one coin there. So you could flip a coin to meet each square. So each bit, of course, each bit that we add that doubles it. So the very common recommendation is choose a random uncommon word, like a troubadour. Does anybody know what a troubadour is? Yeah, yeah, no, sort of, yeah, exactly. So choose an uncommon word, right? We have, uh, uh, we said about 65,000 possibilities of that. And then do a few different um, alterations, do a few different uh, um, uh, changes, a few different formats. So for example, maybe the first letter is caps, is a shift T or a small T, maybe one bit of entropy. You're basically doubling the amount of guesses for the word, based on whether the, the first letter is big or small. And there's a few common substitutions. Some of the zero, some of the O's change to a zero. Maybe the A you change to a four. The I or the L you change to a one. Right? There's a few different substitutions. So each one is another bit of entropy, common uh, substitutions. Then they say, add another symbol or punctuation. Right? So you get about four, four point something uh, bits of entropy. And then you need a digit. Right? So they say that's a very common solution to have uh, all those things. And then, of course, maybe you do the, the number and then the, the punctuation, or maybe first the, the punctuation and then the number. So that's, again, we're basically doubling the amount of guesses that you need to do, which one comes first. So he counts it up, and he says, OK, so each one of these is a one bit of entropy. We're counting it up. We have approximately, approximately 28 bits of entropy, approximately. Now, you can argue with it. Uh, you have a bit more here, a bit less there. Maybe it's 29 bits, basically doubling it at this point. Okay? So he did some very easy math. And if I'm trying to brute force your password on a typical website, I could make 1,000 guesses in a second. Most websites can easily handle that. Um, 2 to the power of 28 at 1,000 guesses a second gives me three days to guess it. That's not really good protection if we're talking about my bank or my email. Okay? So that's not very, very strong. But this is a typical result of the password policies that we're talking about. Nobody can remember, really remember eight or 10 completely random characters. They say, OK, so we have that room to make all the, uh, the entropy, the complexity, but we're going to shorten that now to make it easier for you to remember. Why is that? Because it's not just about having a strong password that's hard to guess. And this is the whole point of the XKCD. You need to remember it. Now, I've looked at that dozens of times. It's right, I looked at it three seconds ago. If I needed to type that out, I probably would get it wrong. Okay, I can't remember that. So it's really hard. So we have, the, um, uh, we have the dichotomy here between hard to guess and easy to remember, except that it's not. It usually goes the other way. Our password policies typically and classically make it easy to guess and hard to remember. So we're not getting anywhere. So that's what's missing from all these password policies. Now here's another recommendation that has been very popular uh, in the past few months. Choose an artist. Choose a song from your favorite artist. Choose some lyrics, 
and then passwordify it. You know, shorten it, take the first letter from each word, change, make those uh, substitutions, swap letters for symbols. Nobody's really going to do that, right? Except this was the BBC suggesting it. Okay, anybody seen this article from? I think it was like uh, three months ago. They came out huge. The BBC has has a lot more uh, audience than the typical security department. And this is what the recommendation. This is mainstream recommendations that people will see this and say, "Oh, that's a good idea." This is what my father would see, and he say, "Oh, I'm going to make a strong password." Except as we saw, that doesn't give us a good strong password, and it's still pretty darn hard to remember. Even worse, this is from the NSA, and they're basically saying the same thing: use misspellings or other languages, patterns, personal information. No way is going to know that your, name, yeah, your password is the name of your dog, right? Now, on the other hand, this is the NSA. They want to crack your password, so maybe they did this to make it easy for them to guess. I, I don't know. But this is never, not a good idea. And this is, this, way, this is the way our industry looks from the outside. This is the way most people see the password recommendations. They say, oh, these are the security experts. They know what they're talking about. Well, no one, nobody ever accuses us of knowing what we're talking about. But let's make things even worse. Because it's not just a hard password that's uh, easy to guess but, but hard to remember. Well, we've got to change it every 30 days or every 90 days. Uh, uh, PCI, the uh, credit card regulation, requires you to change the password every 90 days. So it's bad enough you finally remembered it, but you've got to change it now. Oh, you're going to do it again 30 days from now. Oh, it has to be different ah, and strong and random and don't write it down. And yeah, you're screwed. So there's no way that normal humans I'm saying outside the security industry. Yeah. We're not normal humans. There's no way they can actually comply with the recommendations that we've been feeding them. Now here comes back to the two main things I was talking about, the sticky notes and the password reuse, comes down to the simple fact that we've been giving them bad advice. No way nobody can remember that type of password for a different one for each different site. So maybe, maybe I'll have one really strong password and I'll use it on every single flat site. That's really nice, right? I have a strong password. I've heard this a lot of times. I have a really strong password. Um, I just you know, put it onto my bank and into your cat's blog, and that's all still a strong password. Except that at that point, I don't need to guess your password because you just told me your password for your bank. Okay? And it comes down to the fact that complex passwords, as we've defined, the, uh, defined them till now, are hard to remember. So let's run quick through some solutions. I say, you know, Avi, you have a problem. Show us the solutions. Okay, number one is passphrase. We're going back to the uh, XKCD. This is very simple. Okay, take common words, not uncommon words. Take a set of around 2,000 common words that everybody knows, knows how to spell, thinks about very easily, and choose four of them. Okay, so two to the power of 11 is around 2,000. Choose four of them. That gives us 44 bits of entropy. Okay, 44 bits of entropy, that's a lot stronger than the 28 from before. And again, at the 1,000 guesses per second, that will take us 550 years. So that's already a good strong password, right? And it's a lot easier to remember. Common horse battery staple, everybody knows that. I mean, any four words or any five words, if you want to make it really strong, are easy to, to picture and, and imagine. Okay, so it goes back to the fact that good passwords are not just about strength. Okay, if you want to talk strength, it's entropy. You don't want, besides strength, you need good, which means the human aspect. Okay? Um, I always say security at the expense of usability comes at the expense of security. Or shorter, unusable security isn't. It's never used. Okay? Another, uh, another thing about the password, and this must be actually random. Okay? Choose actual random passwords and not just you know, your favorite quote or something like that. For example, we have here uh, diceware.com. Uh, go on the site, it's basically a long, long text file of a lot of random words and a five-digit number before that. So the point is you take five dice or five, uh, uh, roll one die five times, that's why it's called diceware, roll the fi uh, five dice and you get a word. I roll 2466, I get exert. Roll it again and you get another word, another word, another word. This is a very quick and easy way for a human to generate randomness and random words. And then it becomes a lot easier to, not just to remember, it becomes a lot easier to type. I don't have to start shifting and things like that, especially when we're talking about mobile, right? Start shifting, try to type Troubadour and three on a mobile, it becomes ridiculous. So it's a lot easier to type. Sometimes you need to actually share a password. I send you a zip file, here's the password. Or anybody seen uh, Olympus Has Fallen? 
There's a scene there where they're, they're trying to tell him the passcode to shut off the nuclear bomb. Somebody says the next uh, letter is hashtag. Says, hashtag, what's that? So, oh, shift three. Yes, okay, yes, that's very, very usable. So it comes back to usability. Now the main question is, okay, passphrases are great, they're usable, they're easy to remember. Are they strong? Let's do the same thing we did before. Five word passphrase on dice where there's actually more than 11 bits because there's 7,000 common words. So you get about 12.9 bits of entropy. Do it times five, you get about 13 bits of entropy. Okay, uh, so approximately that, five words. Take a five word thing, it's still very easy to remember. 64.5 bits of entropy, and that's a ridiculous number there already. Okay, We're talking about brute forcing that, uh, I'm not gonna have time to do a section on, the, on that, but that's, yeah, kind of out of range. The drawback is, of course, you gotta remember 35 passwords or 50 passwords, or how many passwords you have. Okay, bigger uh, drawback is that some sites still don't let you do that. And again, that's our fault, because we taught this, the, uh, the developer industry that a good password is those complex things, that password policies. It doesn't, and also it doesn't feel strong, it doesn't look strong. Common horse battery staple doesn't look like a strong password like the Troubadour with all the symbols. So of course, when we get to password manager, who, who uses a password manager? Fantastic, that really comes down to the strongest basic solution when possible. Of course, there's still gonna be some sites that block copy-paste into the password field for security reasons, right? Except that, of course, is the best solution is to store as many passwords as you want, you get 188 bits, and you know what? I don't even know that password, I don't need to remember it. You know, what's your password? I have no clue. And you protect that with a good strong pass, pass phrase, of course. Incredible entropy you have there, and you don't need to remember anything, okay? And then you have the master key. I'm gonna finish up one last thing. I'll skip over this part. Um, sorry, because I ran out of time. So I'm gonna say one last thing, a password expert, right? We mentioned that at the end of 30 days or 90 days or whatever it is, we need to change the user's password. Why? We don't want to give the attacker enough time to crack the password. Well, if you could crack it in 90 days, then he'll use three computers and crack it in 30 days. So you don't really close the window for him on, on the brute force attack. On the other hand, if you created strong passwords, it should take a minimum of 550 years, if not several centuries, uh, millennia, to crack the good strong entropy password, right? Oh. So it doesn't even make sense. If you're worried about, if you have a password that lasts 550 years, why are you changing it after 90 days? There's the usability cost here. And that's what causes people to write down the passwords. And if you think there was a breach, don't wait 90 days. When there is a breach, force the password change right away. Allow users to change the passwords when they need to, if they were ex uh, exposed, um, but don't do that. Uh, the UK, the NCSC is starting to move against password expiry. The NIST came out with recommendation now against password expiry. And yet still every little bank or, or radio site forces you to change your password every 90 to 30 to 90 days. That's ridiculous, so that needs to change. One last thing is I'm gonna finish up with this. Uh, would be remiss not to mention Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned? Anybody familiar with the site? Oh, fantastic, great. You go into Have I Been Pwned, it tells you if your password's already been leaked in all these sites, you can register. And of course, I got hit by uh, LinkedIn, of course, and another one. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, so that's what I'm gonna end with, okay? So just to summarize, where we're talking about secure applications, we're building uh, systems, we want to give recommendations to developers or security departments, what do you need to do? Number one is enable strong passwords, okay? Forget what everybody does. Allow the paranoid people to use a really strong password, whether it's passphrases, don't limit the size. You're not gonna limit me at uh, 12 characters. 40, 50 characters, that's normal, okay? 60 characters and up, uh, uh, that's a minimal maximum length, okay? Enable password managers. Okay, don't block copy-paste. Allow me to use something strong. Okay, and of course we get to the whole password hygiene. No, uh, no expiry, encourage users to have good strong passwords, maybe some uh, help, helpful text. Don't give the silly recommendations of take your uh, favorite song and put lyrics, things like that, but actually give them, give them advice. Link them to a password manager. That's the best thing, link them to Diceware. Link them to that. If you really need to, then you can measure it with X, X, ZXCVBN. I prefer that you force good, strong passwords by possibly even, there are some sites that will generate a password for you, okay? Or maybe a good, strong passphrase. And then the user will do that. All right? Um, I'm done, any questions? Yeah, sir. First up, thank you. Thank you.
And now questions. Yeah. Maybe you don't want uh, like this question, but uh, quantum computers uh, will okay. be very much more uh, faster than modern com uh, normal computers in counting uh, uh, breaking passwords. What, what is the question here? <laughs> the question is um, <laughs> that is uh, an, a, a whole new problem with password management, quantum computers. That mm -hmm. some people really like quantum computers and want them to uh, be a thing, but that is a good, uh, th that is a big security risk with quantum computers that they can break passwords easier. Absolutely, but I'll, I'll do you one better. That problem that we have with potential qu quantum computing, that problem is already here. Now I have another section that I ran over time and didn't get a chance to go into, is about how to crack hashed passwords. Now the problem is, sure, if I run like Hashcat on my computer, I'm going to get maybe, you know, um, 700,000, maybe 7 million hashes per second. That's pretty darn fast, but that's not going to be able to crack the several um, quad quadrillion, I don't even know what number that was there, within any reasonable amount of time. Definitely not for 130 million passwords. However, the CPU is not the fastest thing in the computer anyway. Today we have GPUs. Right, graphical uh, uh, graphical cards, or you know, Bitcoin miners. My three-year-old card. I had uh, uh, an example to show. My three-year-old GPU, mid-range, not top of the line, can crack several about I think it was three billion hashes per second. Upscale go a, a top of the line screen card today costs maybe like a few hundred dollars. You can easily crack se several multiples of that. Bitcoin miners, you buy a little box, you know, everybody familiar with Bitcoin miners, the entire raison d'etre of the Bitcoin miner is to crack several billion passwords per second. So it's just really a question of trading how much money you're spending on how many graphics cards for how many giga hashes per second. Somebody put together, the, uh, uh, the, the creator of Hashcat actually put together a GPU cluster that, if I'm not mistaken, cracks 32 billion hashes per second. So the problem that you're mentioning with quantum, hash, uh, quantum computing, you're absolutely right. But we have that problem today. So it's the same thing. By the way, the solution for that is not to use regular hashes, but to use them, uh, you know, uh, what are called slow hashes, you know, bcrypt, scrypt, pbkdf2, or argon, the, the newest uh, candidate for that. These are slow hashes that make it, even with quantum computing, you still need to work through all that cryptography to be able to crack that hash. As far as the online sites go, it's irrelevant because you're still uh, slowed down by whatever network uh, capacity your, your server has. So of course we're talking about cracking the stolen database. So the solution, again, is slow hashing. All right? Yes, sir. sir. It's very interesting that uh, just now in Sweden, in I think it was on Tuesday, was this big push from the public service TV to talk about passwords and they were showing people in the town and how easy it was to find password dumps and stuff. So the problem with the documentary was many people saw it, but they didn't give any recommendations. Just choose good, strong passwords and then the program was, was over. <laughs> so many people now know about the problem, but not about this, the solution. So uh, I think we have a lot of work to do here in yeah. Sweden, especially now when we I'm have sure. the time. It's just two days ago, we can now take the opportunity. But with quantum computers, just a comment there, with the password hashing and searching the database, it's actually just a robust algorithm, a linear factor, not like in uh, factoring numbers, which we have a, an exponential to linear computation time reduction. So quantum computers will not do any big difference for, for hashing or cracking hashes. Right, so like I said, it's the same problem that you have with, graphic with GPUs anyway. It's already several orders yeah. of magnitude, yeah. so you already have that problem today. By the way, I'm very glad that the public service didn't actually go into recommendations, because they're usually bad, as we saw. Yeah. So it's better not to actually give those recommendations, and you understand why. Because, okay, use a password manager. Is not, that's not really a fun, sexy recommendation there. No. Yeah. By the way, uh, about Sweden, um, when I was preparing uh, uh, this talk, I was looking around for some Swedish banks and things like that, wanted to show some local password recommendations. Actually, I couldn't find any that actually take a simple password. Most of them require either second factor 
or some kind of token, which, by the way, is a great protection against weak passwords. Uh, the workshop one room over is talking about passwords are dead. You know, how they're building little tokens, uh, FIDO keys and things like that. Except that pass even then, passwords are not dead. You still need a good, strong passwords. But it's a great protection. You have something else, another layer of protection. So sure, that's great. So yeah, so have a lot of work. Everywhere has a lot of work, but it seems better here than many places. I got to tell you that. Um, I want to say answer actually the question of the quantum computers with numbers. The best algorithm that can do attack random hashes without much more knowledge of the hash is a square root of the number of uh, of the entropy that you are speaking about. So that's by dividing the number of bits of entropy by two, yeah. according to your numbers. So you just get twice as long passwords, and there you go. You have been protected against yeah. quantum computers. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you one question, though, about uh, well, password managers. Uh, isn't using a password manager shifting the, the target from, let's say, if somebody wants to target me in particular, 1,000 different websites that I might be using to my specific computer where I am using the password manager? Well, obviously, the recommendation would be to use a good password manager <laughs> that encrypts all these things. For example, um, I think it was last year, LastPass was completely hacked into. LastPass is one of the biggest online password managers. And their entire database was stolen. Everybody panicked, except that it turned out, well, you know what? All your passwords are actually pretty well encrypted. Right? So even though I stole the database, I can't get your passwords. I can't get all, your, all, the, all that information because it is encrypted, because it is protected. And because of the way the design, the, I think they did find some flaw afterwards, but that was kind of an impl implementation bug. But the point is that if your uh, password database is well encrypted, that's good protection. You don't need it. The question is how you get to the key of that password, uh, password manager. So again, you need, really, you need to remember something. Use a really long password, uh, uh, password, passphrase, okay? Uh, some of the pass, uh, password managers, like the, um, the local, um, not the online, the local uh, password manager uh, databases, allow you to add an additional encryption key. For example, I use KeePass, so I have you know, my five word or six word uh, passphrase, in addition to a local key file installed on the device. So it gives additional strength there. So really protect against it. And then the entire database is, Encrypted, so yeah, stole the database. Big deal. Yeah. Uh, hi. So uh, I agree with most of the advice that you've been giving, except for probably one of the last slides, where you mentioned that uh, if your users have problems generating random passwords, that you can point them to a website that will generate random passwords for them. That is actually horrible advice. I totally agree with you. I, I, I was I wasn't clear apparently. I was not about point them to to a site but do it for them. Okay. I've seen some so sites that have a built-in uh, password generation, if you want, you know, take a good, strong password. Well, stick, if you stick in your password manager, well, if you have a password manager, you don't need to worry about generation, right? Um, but I, I've been starting to recommend a half site to generate strong passphrases. So yeah, they so can remember it if they want to. Use your own password manager if you want, if you have that, that's great. But if not, the lowest common den denominator, I'm gonna get my dad, to remember, to automatically get a passphrase. Because if he tries to think of it himself, it's not gonna be strong. Yeah, so uh, I would like to uh, uh, add something to that. So last year we did some research into password managers and also websites that generate, pa uh, generate passwords. A lot of them actually send your password to the remote website, so they have the website. But not just that, so some websites also use third-party JavaScript to link your password <laughs> to whoever holds the JavaScript. So definitely don't type your password into random websites, even for checking or for generating. Absolutely. And even if you copy-paste your password from uh, a website that randomly generated on a client side, it might get leaked by JavaScript. Yeah. Or any kind of side channel you might have there. By the way, one of the password, ma uh, password meter sites that I saw, uh, best password meter site ever, so I think it was after the Twitter hack uh, a couple years ago. As soon as you start typing in your password, it says, is my Twitter password secure? As soon as you t start typing in, it says, no! You just typed in your password into a random site. Of course, it's not secure. <laughs> What's the big deal here? So yeah, as you say, obviously, uh, any kind of side channel leakage, any way of your password going out, I don't need to guess it anymore because it just got out. Let me guess, the third-party JavaScript is over HTTP, right? <laughs> well, I'm guessing. <laughs> I, 
I, I totally agree with that, but the problem with that is, as we've seen, a lot of these recommendations, so sure, you know, the BBC recommendations are better than what most, past, what most users do. But that's really short-sighted, in my perspective, because that's still training them to think of the password themselves. Humans do not think of good passwords themselves. We're in, the only place we're good at making random, uh, uh, generating randomness is YouTube comments. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you, maybe, I don't know, maybe you could make a tool to generate passwords from YouTube comments. That might be interesting. But other than that, we, we can't generate good passwords. So anything built around human randomness is, is doomed to failure, in my opinion. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, we are now uh, a little bit, uh, just one minute over schedule, and we need to get the next speaker up and uh, running. So thank you again. Thank you.